What is up guys, that said here, it's Sanctuary Sunday once again and this means one thing, we're looking at the world of Diablo beyond the mechanics. Today's video is dedicated to some of the popular, iconic class sets and not how they're obtained but rather the rich lore that surrounds them. Check it out. I'll begin with my personal favorite and probably not surprise anyone by saying it's the armor of a Khan. It strengthens your Crusader and reduces your tremendous wrath costs and the full set guarantees that your strongest ability is up at all times. But who is this Akan and what is his relationship with Akarat and his champions? To find out, we have to go back in time, well over 200 years before the events of Diablo 3. Around that time, the fabled general Rakis and his army began their conquest the same journey that will one day result in the Grand Kingdom of Westmarch. The glorious events surrounding the military genius overshadow the clandestine works of an average ranking priest of the Zacharum faith. His name was Akan, and he was one of the few that had the foresight and clarity to observe the taint of Mephisto in the church. While he could not possibly know that the Lord of Hatred himself was the cause, he was convinced something had to be done in order to preserve his precious faith. While the high-ranking priests were heavily exposed to Mephisto's corruption, Akan managed to avoid their rituals and began his work towards the establishment of a new order. He searched in secrecy for warriors of unrivaled strength and conviction in the light. He even avoided warriors with paladin training, fearing that evil may have already planted its seed in their souls. The order that he established was small, less than 500 men, but strong and pure. He called them crusaders, he armored them, blessed them with his teachings and then sent them off to find a way to save the Zacharum faith and purge the world of evil. Akan stayed behind and tried to fight the corruption within Travinkal, an act of bravery that would cost him his life. Far away from Akan and his troubles, we'll take a look at another cast of holy warriors. A lot of players from the original Diablo 3 probably remember Inna's set, and especially the pants, as a staple of high-end characters. Items are less homogenized in Reaper of Souls, so at the moment mostly monks give Inna the time of day. Still it begets the question, just who is this Inna and what is her mantra? Well, turns out that Inna is not even a mortal. She is actually a goddess of the sky in the Shaptev religion, practiced by the monks of Ivgorod. The Shaptev faith involves the worship of a whooping thousand and one gods and goddesses, each of them based on every kind of physical object and concept in existence. Little else is known about the Shaptev tenets, except that it divides the gods into those of order and those of chaos. The monks of Ivgorod preach that only the holy can find salvation in Inna's arms. She is considered infinite in her glory, radiant to behold, and with righteous judgment beyond that known to man. Inna is not beyond the reach of mortals, however, and those who gird themselves in her wisdom will gain her favor. For now, let's step away from godhood and envelop ourselves in a berserker rage, because we're going to talk about the Immortal King. Even though it's not the most used set at the moment, it's without a doubt the most recognizable one, and considering the potential of the legendary gem Enforcer, it might be looked upon more favorably in the near future. What's the story, however? Who is this immortal king? Is it Bulkathos? No, not really. Let's look back once again to a time even before General Rakis and his heroics. The title Immortal King did belong to Bulkathos, but it was also given to Vorusk, a mighty barbarian warrior who did the unthinkable and united the warring barbarian clans. His strength was legendary. The story goes that he struck so hard with the boulder breaker that his hands would have shattered if they were not protected. For a time, he strode the western lands like a god. 
Under his leadership, the Council of Elders was formed in Harrogath. At the height of his power, smarter foes fled from Vorsk rather than face him, which vexed the Immortal King greatly. He ordered the Master Blacksmith Chelanik to forge a belt for him that would increase the speed of his descent upon the enemy. Chelanik delivered his chain and Vorsk became able to catch even the swiftest of his opponents so he might show them the consequences of challenging the Immortal King or his realm. Now, let's vault away from the raging barbarians and take a peek into the elegant Deathbringer that is the Natalia set. If you're a demon hunter, there's a good chance you've used the double piece set bonus at least once in your career. And who could forget the oldest version of this set, giving you the 2 discipline per second bonus. It does raise the question, who was Natalia to embody the demon hunter so thoroughly? Well, in Diablo 2, you've actually met Natalia in the Corrupt Docks, giving you the ever lovely preview of the Assassin class that was later introduced in the Lord of Destruction. Her lore, however, was equally interesting. Natalia is a demon hunter that, after the defeat of the Prime Evils, abandoned her previous calling as an assassin. She was once a member of the Order of the Vizjatar a secretive grouping of mage slayers who were tasked with eradicating the demonic corruption from the mage clans. The need for such an order was evident after the events of the Mage Clan Wars, a catastrophic amalgam of demonic influence and hunger for power that left Kejistan ravaged. The mere existence of the order Natalia was a part of was enough to prevent many mages from the temptations of demonic influence, but after the defeat of the Prime Evils, it was clear to her, it was not the mages that needed to be pursued relentlessly, but the demons themselves. Thus, she left the Vizjatar and joined the ranks of the Demon Hunters. The devastation of the Mage Clan Wars was undeniable, a monstrous act in the heart of the Kejistani civilization, but that was not the only war to be waged in these lands. Some of them remained hidden in the lush Torajan jungles to the east of Kurast. More specifically, the wars of the Umbaru tribes and their witch doctor leaders during the Harvest of Souls. One such witch doctor and participant in the war was Tukam. His title, and I bet you know this name very well, was the Jade Harvester. Tukam was a living legend, and many believed that he was not a mortal man but a spirit sent from the unformed land. Every Umbaru knows about him and about his iconic armor that he crafted himself, carving each piece of armor from a single slab of green jade. This armor gave him the title of Jade Harvester and he claimed that it strengthens his connection to the spirit world. He fought the other tribes for centuries, outliving all of his beloved and friends, yet never wept knowing that in time he will meet them in the unformed land. He did not see the other tribes as enemies, and the words of his mercy were spreading across the land. Fighting the impossible battles, the thoughts of his family gave him courage. In the end, long after he lost everyone he held dear, he was finally defeated in combat and met his end on a sacrificial altar, welcoming his long-awaited death. When he crossed the veil and entered the unformed land, he finally reunited with spirits of those he loved, and those he once fought met him as family. And last but not least, let's revisit one of the most iconic figures in Diablo history through the set piece devoted to him. He was a Haradrim leader, a mage, and one of the most tortured figures in Sanctuary's bloody history. Of course, I'm talking about Talrasha, and it's probably his vestments that you're wearing right now, if you're dedicated to the arcane arts. Let's take a peek into his story. Talrasha, along with Deckard Cain's ancestor Jared, led the Haradrim Order on their sacred task to capture and imprison the Three Evils. When they attempted to capture Baal, however, the Lord of Destruction shattered the Soul Stone intended for him. With no time to reforge the artifact and desperate to contain Ball's spirit, 
Tao Rasha volunteered to use his own body as an extension of the prison. The largest shard of the shattered soul stone was plunged into the brave mage's chest as he allowed himself to be possessed by Ball. Tyriel, along with Jared Kane and the other Haradrim, imprisoned Tau Rasha's body in a secret tomb in the Canyon of the Magi in the desert Aranok, where Tau Rasha and Ball's spirits were to wrestle with each other for all eternity. In time, the tomb's location was forgotten, but evil cannot be contained forever, and when the Dark Wanderer found Tau Rasha's tomb during the events of Diablo II, the ancient Haradrim was defeated. Not by a prime evil, I might add, but the gullible mortal hand of Marius. He removes the soul stone from Taurasha's chest, freeing Ball from his prison and destroying the last vestiges of the mortal soul. The only remnants of one of the most influential Horadrim are the legends and, of course, his prized armor. And this concludes this week's Sanctuary Sunday. I hope the class sets feel at least a bit more epic in your eyes and you liked their short stories. If you did, I would appreciate your subscription to my channel and I'll see you guys next time.